Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Millions of readers all over the world are drawn to fiction that explores our fears, horror, cells. And no one does it better or more prolifically than my guest today, Stephen King. He's written more than 60 books, sold close to 400 million copies. He is the master manipulator of dark places and the paranormal. If you're not a reader, you may have seen The Shining, Carrie, Stand By Me, all films based on his stories. He's been writing for half a century. How has our appetite for fear evolved? Stephen King in Florida, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. I wish we could do it in person. Me too. But nonetheless, it is a pleasure to see you on my screen. And let me begin by asking you about the, the threat that we all, all over the world, in Florida, in the UK, all over the world are living with, and that is COVID-19. Has that invisible threat of the virus in any way dimmed your enthusiasm for writing fiction about dark places? I would have to say actually not, because uh, I've been in quarantine, sheltering in place for part of the time. Things have eased up a little bit, and I've managed to get my two vaccinations. Yay, me! <laughs> and uh, I'm not entirely protected yet, and I think that we all have to continue to take precautions, but. One of the things that all this solitude and uh, sort of being in one place has done is it freed my imagination. Uh, it's a place to go, a place to forget about what's going on in the world and think about anything from vampires to curses to uh, kids who talk to dead people to any of that stuff. So it's been good for me in a way, and I think uh, you're going to see a great uh flood of novels from uh, writers who no longer have an excuse not to sit down at their machines. But that, that is very interesting that the, the pervasive anxiety of the society around you certainly hasn't put you off from sort of delving into the macabre, the, the, the dark, the difficult and the twisted in your fiction as you've done for more than 50 years. Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of people uh, enjoy horror stories because it allows them to express their anxieties in ways that don't have anything to do with the real world, if you see what I mean. Uh, it gives them a chance to uh, experience emotions maybe that are not allowed in polite society, like aggression, fear, anger, uh, all those things are great. And when you see a monster movie or when you read a scary book, it allows you to uh, sort of test drive those emotions, which is a good thing, I think. I think it's good to get those things out. It's a kind of catharsis. But of course, I would say that. Yeah, you would say that. You're sort of pro-scaring people. And I, I guess you feel that, that scaring people when they're already scared is, is a choice and that many people still make that choice. I think that it's uh, almost like uh, the old time days when people would uh, draw blood. Uh, this way, it sort of draws anxiety. At least I like to think so. I hope so. Uh, there are a lot of psychological uh, reasons to enjoy uh, fiction that's fearful. And in particular, when you deal with some of the supernatural elements or the, the monsters and that sort of thing, we understand it's not real. Yeah. So we feel that it's safe enough to go there. Whereas when you have something like coronavirus, that's very, very real. And one of the things that interests me is how many books uh, came out right around the time of the coronavirus that uh, dealt with that particular issue. There's a 
a really good one called The End of October, which deals with a pandemic that's eerily like what we're going through now. But that's not the same thing that we're talking about, because that's very, very close to the real anxieties. You, you wrote your own book about a, a contagious, highly infectious, dangerous disease, didn't you, back in the late 1970s. Have you revisited that to look at the degree to which you got stuff right about the way in which societies react to that sort of invisible but pervasive health threat? Yes, I revisited it quite a lot because The Stand is a mini-series over here on TV, and I think that it will eventually show in, in uh, England if it hasn't already. And uh, it's very eerie to see um, scenes where people are wearing masks and dumping bodies into mass graves. Uh, we saw too much footage over here of refrigerated trucks, particularly at the height of the pandemic in places like Los Angeles and New York, uh, where there was just a backlog of bodies and they were being stored. And that really brought me back to the mm. story that I wrote. You, are you going to write another virus novel? No, I think not. I think that people have uh, seen enough of that. The interesting thing for me is how novelists are going to deal with uh, the current situation where everybody is masking up and uh, everybody's trying to maintain social distancing. Let me, at this point, invite you to travel back in time with me because you've talked about why uh, horror and the genre that you write appeals to readers because you say it allows them to confront their deepest fears in a controlled environment. But I'm interested in not the reader but the writer, that is you, and I'm interested in why as a very young person, even as a kid, you were attracted to the very dark places in your childhood writing. And then as a young man in your 20s, you, uh, your first book, of course, that was a great success was Carrie, which, which you know, delved into the paranormal and, and was pretty dark in its own way. Why? What was it that took you there? Well, you know, a lot of times uh, when I'm doing interviews or when I'm doing uh, appearances where there are questions afterwards, somebody will ask, uh, what were you like as a kid? And the subtext to that question is, what messed you up so badly that you got twisted and you wrote all these horrible stories. Yeah, pe people oh, want to know whether you, you are a bit of a sicko or whether there was something very dark in your childhood that took you in the direction you, you went. Well, that's very Freudian, and I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, I think. <laughs> uh, you know, the thing is, I was born with a big imagination, and as a kid, uh, it kind of, it made my life uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Uh, I was afraid of the dark. Uh, I was afraid of noises in the house. Uh, I had nightmares. I could imagine uh, uh, all sorts of awful things happening to me. And little by little, I was able to turn that uh, in another direction and harness uh, what had terrified me, what had scared me as a kid, and start to write stories that would scare other people. You know, in a way, this is the best of all possible worlds because there are people who go to psychiatrists with their fears and they pay them a certain amount of money to get an hour. It's not even a full hour, it's a 50 minute hour. And uh, what I do is I bring these fears out and uh, people pay me to, to read them. But, you know, there is no good, clear answer to your question. It's a mystery. Uh, but it does intrigue me that you... Sorry to interrupt, Stephen, but it, it does intrigue me that you write a lot about kids. Kids who are often quite lonesome, but they do have special powers. They see things, uh, including ghostly and paranormal things, which adults simply cannot see. I've just finished reading your latest crime book, Later, which is all about a kid who has that precise uh, talent, that gift. Did you ever, as a kid, feel you could somehow see things, you had a gift that adults around you simply couldn't understand? Oh, yeah, I could see things, and uh, they were very clear, and I wrote them down. 
And uh, one of the ways that you tell uh, somebody who's intensely creative, and as a kid, I was intensely creative, and I still am now, but I have better control over it now than I did as a child. So, you know, the thing is, you grow up and you learn how to harness that. And uh, childhood was vivid for me, and I enjoy revisiting that. And one of the things that I like about it is that kids have a wider perspective and they're more apt to uh, take into account uh, the paranormal or the strange. I mean, kids believe in Santa Claus. Uh, kids believe in the tooth fairy. So it's very easy for them to believe that a house might be haunted. Talking of beliefs, does Stephen King believe in God? The jury's out on that, but uh, as somebody famous said, um, if you don't believe and there is one, uh, you're, you're losing out. It doesn't hurt hmm. to believe in God. And uh, so I choose to believe in a power greater than myself. Why not? Uh, it seems to help. And uh, so, yeah. The, the, reason that I, the reason I'm intrigued is partly because your books you know, are in, in many ways about good and evil. You know, there are good people in your books and there are some really atrociously bad people in your books. I don't know if you yourself use the word evil, but if you do, where, where do you think evil comes from? Well, evil's a tough one. And it's, it's I was raised uh, a Methodist and I, I had a very uh, traditional Protestant religious upbringing. And I carried a lot of that to my fiction, and a lot of it is about good and evil. And one of the things that interests me the most uh, about the stories that I write is how do good people behave when they're faced with difficult circumstances? So I try to work on that as much as I can. But when you talk about evil, the question is, is there such a thing as outside evil? That is to say, is possession, demonic possession, really mm. a possible thing, or is it uh, a psychological aberration? Uh, we know about inside evil. Whether or not there's outside evil is a question for uh, fiction, and I've written about it many times. One of the things that has always struck me about very evil people, serial killers like Ted Bundy, uh, the... Uh, the Moors murders, if you will, in, mm. in England. These are terrible, terrible things. Uh, but if we put those people to death, the evil doesn't care. The evil just flies away into someone else. And then they you're faced with uh, other terrible things because we have those elements that evil is in all of us. I that, wouldn't go that, so far. That, as that, that's interesting. That is the perennial question, isn't it? I mean, it's raised in your books, but it's also raised in world history. What are we, all of us, you, me, actually capable of when it comes to the idea that we all have very dark and bad stuff within us that we must control? We do, and maybe we go to a horror movie like Saw or... Salem's Lot or The Stand, and we get rid of some of those feelings. Uh, we find a place to put them that's safe. We almost have to do that uh, because we all have violent impulses. It's part of our genetic makeup, if you will. So in that way, I like to think that I'm serving the public interest. Well, it, <laughs> and we thank you for it. But let, let, if I may, let me get personal with you because you, you come across as a man who's done a lot of deep thinking about your own psyche and the psyche of all of us in the human race. Why was there a period in your life where you clearly found uh, real issues with substance abuse and with control and addiction? What, what went wrong for you? Well, nothing went wrong with me. I was a... Uh... Uh, uh, an alcoholic and a drug addict from the beginning. And uh, really? from the, oh God, from the time I had my first drink, I just said, give me some more of that. And the time that I first uh, snorted cocaine, I thought to myself, I found God. Uh, I can remember very well, I had an accident 
1999. A guy hit me with a van, and uh, I ended up in the hospital with broken bones and broken ribs and, you know, a concussion and a mess. My leg was basically uh, pencil shavings from the knee on down on the right side. I'm lucky to be alive. And when I finally came out of it three days later, the doctor said, how is your pain level? Is it one to 10? I said, it's like 20. It's like 25. And he said, well, we have a wonderful new drug that's called OxyContin. And I think you're going to find that it controls the pain. And the first time I took one of those pills, I said to myself, this is my new addiction. Um, and I was. I, I used that stuff for the next four or five years. But that's also like imagination. It's something that's hardwired, I think, into, this, into the system. It's a disease, and uh, I control it on a day-by-day -day basis. And uh, I don't drink. I don't use. I haven't for 32 years. So uh, this is a better way to live. But I am still uh, an active alcoholic. There's no doubt about it. Well, I'm not active, but I'm in remission. Yeah. So. yeah. Let me ask you how you feel American culture has evolved over the last half century, because that's the span of your writing career. It strikes me that when you began in the 60s, you were writing in a very different context from the one that we see young people growing up in today, uh, you know, the digital revolution, the impact of the information flows that come with the internet, social media, it's, right. it's, it's changed culture so profoundly. Do you think it is changing the tastes of, of what people want to read and what you therefore need to, to write? Well, it's been a very good thing for creative people, for artistic people, uh, for years, uh, writers, screenwriters, novelists. We were uh, in what you'd call a seller's market. But now, thanks to all the different streaming platforms and to audio books and to Kindle books, you know, the books that you read on a screen, everything is exploded so that we're now in a, a, a we're basically in a, a, a seller's market. Uh, there's all sorts of call for um, creatives, for people who can write stories and make things up, basically. It's everywhere. Uh, and the question of whether or not it has changed the way that uh, people consume, I would have to say that people are a little more jaded now than they were in the old days. Uh, when I started in 1974, you had some very simple things. You had books that were hardcovers. Uh, then they became paperbacks. If you were very, very lucky, they might become a movie. But that was pretty much the end of it right there. And now the choices are, are very wide. And I think, yeah, I have to say people are a little bit jaded. But do you think they're, they're jaded in a, in a different sense, a sense that thanks to the phone they have and the laptop and the tablet, they can access the most extraordinary and often horrifying graphic images and graphic stories at the click of a mouse or a button. Do, do you feel that when you sit in your writing room and, and conjure up imaginings for a new story, you have to go further in terms of the, the graphic element, the violence, the horror, the, the fear-inducing stuff? Do you have to push the envelope further than ever before? No, I don't need to do that because I'm not interested in horror per se. I'm interested in people and what people do. What I would like uh, for readers, for you, Stephen, to uh, feel when they read one of my books is I would like you to fall in love with the characters and want the best in the world for them. I, in other words, yes, I'm a horror writer. I won't mm. uh, disagree with that. But I, what I really want to do is to engage your uh, positive emotions as much as I can so that when terrible things happen, you don't want to see somebody's head come off. I think that, in a way, the Friday the 13th movies were almost like snuff movies. You didn't go to see the campers uh, at Crystal Lake get away. Uh, you, you wanted to see them killed and, with arrows and buzz saws and chainsaws and God knows what. You know, I was in a, a, a supermarket down here in Florida 
And uh, I came around a corner and there was a woman coming the other way and she pointed at me. She said, I know who you are. You're Stephen King. You write all those horrible things and that's okay. That's all right. But I like uplifting things like that movie Shawshank Redemption. And I said, <laughs> I wrote that. And she said, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. But, but interestingly, when you talk about what really matters to you, that is connecting with characters, generating love from reader to character, you could, you know, Shakespeare would have said that, Charles Dickens, Tolstoy, all of the great writers would say just the same thing. Does it, do you really resent the fact that you get put in this box of the highly commercial thriller guy? You're not really seen as a, as a literary writer, a guy who actually has an enormous, immense gift with words. Does that stick in your throat? I'm too old now for it to stick in my throat, but there was a time when I resented it very much. And there was also a time when I believed, as a younger man, more naive, that there was a way to build a bridge between, let's say, the literary uh, and, the, and the popular, that there was a way to actually have both things at the same time. And uh, I think there was a time when that did happen, although even at the height of his popularity, uh, Charles Dickens was loved by the, uh, by the multitude. Uh, uh, by the people in the cheap seats, if you will. Uh, they crowded the docks at, at uh, Baltimore when the latest uh, edition of the latest chapter of Little Dorrit came in, uh, and the dock actually collapsed and people drowned because they were so anxious to see what happened next. Hmm. And there were the literary critics of that day felt that, uh, that that was just below them because there is this sort of elitist attitude, isn't right. it, at the bottom, that if too many people like it, it really can't be very good. Uh, final thought, and it brings me to the present day. You have 6.5 million Twitter followers. You use your platform often to air your political views, which are, I think it's fair to say, liberal and have been very anti-Trump over the last few years. But it strikes me that Donald Trump has one gift, which is to use fear as an extraordinarily effective political weapon. His famous inauguration speech, January 2017, the one that we sort of call the American carnage speech, was all about using fear as a means to rally political support. I'm just wondering whether you're interested in that and whether you, Stephen King, are considering writing a, 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 a novel about where America is today, weaving politics and fear together. <laughs> Well, I did, in a way. I, I wrote a book uh, called The Dead Zone uh, that had a character in it named Greg Stilson, who goes from being a door-to-door -door Bible salesman to a candidate for president of the United States. And he's a terrible person. And at the same time, he's very much like Donald Trump. And uh, I was so distressed by George Bush's Iraq war. Uh, I wrote a book called Under the Dome. And I had a character uh, in that book named Jim Rennie, uh, who do, is the worst person in charge of a, a crisis, a disaster situation that you could possibly imagine. And uh, I wasn't thinking about Bush so much as I was thinking about Cheney. You know, everything that I write has a certain subtext because, man, I think that anybody who writes a long book they have to be thinking about something other than story. There has to be some concern that has to do with their own life. So I try to keep Twitter, uh, the political stuff on Twitter, but in the books, hmm. that subtext is there. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's all in there somewhere. Stephen King, it has been a great pleasure having you on Hard Talk. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful, thank you.